Welcome to Health and Veritas. I'm Harlan Krumholtz. And I'm Howie Foreman. We are physicians and professors at Yale University. We're trying to get closer to the truth about health and healthcare. This week, we will be speaking with Dr. Thomas Balsazak, the Chief Clinical Officer of Yale New Haven Health System. But first, we like to check in on current health news. What has caught your attention this week, Colin? Yeah, I thought I'd get back to the pandemic and, and share just a little bit about a study that was published and then maybe give people a framework to think about their own risks. So there was a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, as you know, one of the top journals, that came out that was addressing this question that many people have, which is, if I've been infected, to what extent am I protected from future infections? And if I've been infected, do I need to be vaccinated? Or is it as good as a vaccination? Or how does this work? And and investigators from Israel evaluated what we know to be the waning level of protection against confirmed SARS-CoV-2, COVID, uh, among people who had previously had an infection or among people who were uninfected but had previously received the Pfizer vaccine. And what they found was that, yeah, I guess it's no surprise that if you had been previously infected, then you had a level of protection. Actually, it seemed like that level of protection might even have been better than the vaccination, but like the vaccination, it waned over time. And for people who were uninfected and got two shots, uh, it was really important that they got that third shot in order to get at the same level of someone who had had, for example, one or two shots and had been previously infected. And the way I sort of fashioned it after looking at all the data was sort of that an infection is a little bit more than a vaccination. And so, you know, if you've, if you've been known to be infected, you can consider it like an extra vaccination. But like a vaccination, it's not a lifelong protection. And many people have discovered that through what people are calling breakthrough infection. I don't even consider them breakthroughs. They're just another infection that people are experiencing. And so, you know, now, particularly in the Northeast, we're seeing a lot of people uh, being infected. And a lot of them are wondering whether should, if I haven't gotten the third, should I get the third or so forth? And what I'm telling people is, if you've had a confirmed infection, you can consider it sort of like you just got a boost. And, uh, but you also need to know that this is going to wane over time. And it looks like at six, eight months, that people start getting in a position as if, uh, you know, now they're vulnerable again. And, and by the way, even if you've been vaccinated recently, even if you've had a recent infection, in these data, you're, there still are people getting reinfected relatively soon. So when we talk about waning immunity, it's not like everyone's protected and then, then some people all of a sudden begin to be infected, but people are infected along the way. It's just the risk starts to increase to the point where prior to the, the vaccination or infection. So, you know, it's not, people may say, I was just infected, now I've been infected again just a month or two later. Yeah, that happens sometime. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to get to one other thing, which is a framework for decision making. A lot of people are asking me, like, what, should I go out? Are there risks? How does this work? And, and I say it like this. I said that you need to figure out whether you want to spend your risk on the things you're doing. So is it important enough for you to be among people? Is it a big family event? Is it something that you're willing to take some risk for because of what's what you're participating in? So if it's a minimal thing, like I'm going to the store, I don't mind wearing a mask. I don't know. Keep wearing a mask. It protects you. But if you're in a social situation where it's important to you and you're willing to take the risk of potentially being infected, then then maybe that's worth it. But you have to think about the consequence. And the consequence is a combination of you know, how healthy you are, what would be the risk of you getting infected. This variant is much less risky than prior variants for people who are otherwise low risk than what they're risking is getting sick for a few days and having to isolate. And then so that consequence might be, what have I got planned for the next week? What is it I'm doing? Am I going on vacation? Am I, have I got important meetings? Have I got some events that I wouldn't want to miss. And so then that might be more important than thinking, am I going to end up in the ICU, which for a healthy person is now much less likely, but it's about whether or not, you know, just like you would think about the flu, for example, do I, if I got the flu next week, you know, would that, how big a deal would that be? Well, it may be a big deal if it's my daughter's wedding. It may be a much less of a deal if it's just an ordinary week. Yeah, and it's such an important point that we are still collecting what seems to be very simple data, data that you would almost think we would know 
three months after the vaccination program began. We're still collecting that. And one of the questions I still have, maybe it's a little less relevant now, but early on, the sense was that vaccination was more homogeneous protection across the population and that infection was more highly variable with some people having fairly effective immunity and some people having lower levels of antibodies. And even that, I don't think we have good data on at this point because we're not doing the type of rigorous uh, clinical trials, prospective trials, where we're, we're drawing blood from people immediately after infection to measure antibody levels. So a lot of questions. Yeah, and even without the antibodies, we, we do know that, that some people are still protected. So that's why we're not recommending people, hey, go have your antibody levels checked because yeah, it's that's not true. a great proxy for their It's not just antibodies. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. But so many questions yet to answer. So thank, thanks for doing that. Yeah, yeah. Let's get on to Tom. So I'm really delighted to introduce Dr. Thomas Balsazak, who is the chief clinical officer for Yale New Haven Health System. He was named chief medical officer of Yale New Haven Hospital in 2014, and named chief medical officer of the health system in 2016. And over the last two decades, he served in various leadership positions at Yale New Haven Hospital, including senior vice president, patient safety and quality, associate chief of staff. He's also an associate clinical professor of medicine, the lecturer in the School of Public Health at Yale University. He received his medical degree from the University of Connecticut Masters of Public Health uh, from our School of Public Health. That's when I first met him. And he's also trained in internal medicine at Yale New Haven Hospital, where he also served as chief medical resident. I, you know, I, I want to say a couple of things first, and that is that I first met him when he took a class the first year I was ever teaching it at Yale in 2001. Yeah, how did, how did he, he was, do, Howie? How did he do? And he did really well. He, he got the oh, highest cool. grade in the class. I keep his highest keep grade his exam. in the class. He, for, well, for, yeah, he did. How he's, he did. How his first year, he was he was just he wasn't really sure what he was doing. I, listen, let me finish my spiel. So I, um, but I do want to say that ever since that time, he has been a guest lecturer in that class. He is a much loved uh, teacher. He is a great mentor. He is someone who I've referred students to either from undergrads, from graduate students, as well as our medical students, uh, and has always offered his um, support and counsel, uh, which I, I value a lot myself to this, this health system that he is clinically in charge with is a challenging health system to deal with. And, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Harlan, for the first question. But I have a lot of questions today about how do we manage in the time post-COVID. Yeah, well, first of all, what a pleasure to have Tom. Tom, thanks for taking the time with us. And uh, just to share with folks, you know, I have such great admiration for the work you do. And, and you're such a good friend. And I, I really appreciate having you here and feel that we're lucky. Uh, but what I wanted to start out with was your chief medical officer for the Yale Health System. People may wonder, what is this job, chief medical officer? I and mean, for, for people who aren't in the know in hospital administration, health system administration, this may seem like a, an unusual title. So can you tell us what, what is this job, chief medical officer? Yeah, sure. Uh, but the medical organizations in the United States, hospitals in particular, um, they really, they really go back to uh, how, how they're organized. Really goes back to the Flexner report, and shortly after the Flexner report came out, um, they realized that not only was medical education in need of a tremendous overhaul, but just, just to anchor people, the Flexner report is what, like 1910? You're referring to a exactly. report that was from like 100 years ago, right? Exactly. I mean, Abraham Flexner was asked uh, by Congress to look into the proliferation of poorly trained physicians in the United States. There were medical schools all over the place. I think there were over a thousand medical schools in the United States at that time. And he came back with his report saying it needs to be overhauled or it needs to be a way of, of having oversight around medical schools and the same with hospitals. And from that report, you can sort of tie almost directly back to that, the evolution of how hospitals uh, have come about and now health systems. And Shortly thereafter, they created this idea that hospitals should have a governing body, a fiduciary body, made up of individuals that had that institution's best outcomes in, in their hearts. Uh, but it also needed a group of physicians. It needed a medical staff. And they came up with this idea that the medical staff, although independent of management, 
needed to be overseen by the governing body. And sitting in the role between the medical staff and the governing body was this idea of chief of staff. And in some institutions, depending on where they were and what their druthers were, they would elect the chief of staff. Some would be employed by the, by the hospitals, uh, selected by the medical staff, what have you. And over the, over the last you know, hundreds or so years, as you mentioned, this was about 100 years ago, this role evolved and it became this idea of a chief medical officer where it was recognized that in the management of a hospital, now a health system, there needed to be a senior physician executive because most of the management post-Flexner of hospitals uh, was non-physicians, non-clinicians. There are people who were in business, people who had a background in, in, in uh, medical economics and other things, thinking that ideally, you know, folks that are physicians should be focusing on the patients, should be focusing on healthcare, whereas the business of a hospital, the idea of uh, running a business that, um, you know, has human resources and finance and treasury and supply chain and all those things that are necessary to run a business, physicians aren't really very good at that. But yet you need a chief physician executive to be able to inform the management structure of the hospital and also relate the clinical enterprise to the board, to the management staff, and really be the, the, the communication between the medical enterprise and the management enterprise. Can, can you tell me when the pandemic began for us, when we started to see cases, when everything started to slow down, the, the transformation of both our hospital and the health system happened very, very quickly. Can, can you give our listeners some sense of what the mechanics of that were and how do you think about that when you have a health system that is, is quite frankly funded by private and public sources, but those are not sources that are flexible. It's not like you're gonna get extra funding during the pandemic. How do you think about getting ready for something that you've never experienced before? Well, I, I mean, I can tell you our personal experience and from talking to my colleagues around the country, I think many of us had very similar kinds of experiences. One is, you know, as Harlan mentioned, uh, the Yale Haven Health System is about a $6 billion system. It's, it spans about 100 miles, which is the coastline of Connecticut, and has seven inpatient campuses and five hospitals, about 30,000 employees, and just, just over 6,000 physicians that are on the medical staff. So it's a pretty large enterprise, but in terms of American healthcare, we're only about a moderate-sized health system. Um, but we have a couple of, I think, defining and unique strengths. One is, is that you know, our partnership with the Yale School of Medicine and the faculty really has given us a clinical depth and breadth, which I think is world class. The other thing, too, is given our geography, given our, rela given our relationship with the school and our presence as an academic medical center and our aspirations to be an academically based health system, it's attracted a level of leadership and employee really at all levels that I think is second to none. And we've also been successful. We haven't had tremendous margins, but in the world of not-for-profit healthcare, we've been good, we've been healthy. You know, we have about a three to 4% operating margin every year, which allows us to have a pretty healthy balance sheet. And so we walked into the pandemic in January of 2020, knowing that it was coming with, with I think, a lot of strengths, clinical strengths, operational strengths, and financial strengths, which we needed each of, you know, as, you know, March rolled around and the pandemic really hit with full force across our health system. Given our proximity to New York, you know, we really saw a rapid ramp up in cases in March. And really every, every part of this organization, from our treasury to our operating teams to our clinical teams, really stepped up and we organized, like most institutions, around an incident command structure. And we had both incident command structures at the local delivery networks across our five hospitals, but also coordinating across our health system. And we brought a small group of individuals together to make some very important high level decisions. One is that we were gonna pay whatever needed to be paid to whomever in order to get the equipment, product, staff in our hospitals. So you saw the supply chain disruptions. And at one point we went from, you know, supply chain folks will tell me I got this wrong, but I know on an order of magnitude, I'm right. We used to spend about 60 cents on an N95 respirator, you know, those blue 3M respirators. It went, at, at one point we were spending $9 a piece. And so we paid whatever we had to pay in order to make sure our staff were safe. 
we, we paid bonuses to our staff. We didn't let anybody go. And as you know, we stopped doing elective surgeries, our ERs, stopped seeing patients because people were home. We didn't furlough or lay off anyone because we knew that as the patients came back in, we would need those people. And then on, you know, on, on the organizational front, we stood up, for example, here in New Haven, two brand new full ICUs. We turned over two small floors of the Smilo Cancer Hospital into fully functioning ICUs with all the attendant stress that that created on all of our operating teams, including our ICUs, our physician teams. And every single group stepped up because we had in the bank that equity of talented staff, talented clinicians, and also the assets and resources to be able to do that. And you all, I know, had your own part in it, Howie, whether it be in radiology or Harlan, you know, across the physician enterprise, you, you saw it yourself, but that's nothing you could have prepared for with three weeks. It took 10 years of equity to be able to have that readiness to be able to respond. Can you just give our listeners a sense, though, in the entire time you've been at Yale uh, prior to the pandemic, did Yale New Haven Hospital ever lose money? No. For the last 40 years, we've never lost a dime. And, and since the pandemic, can you give the listeners some sense of what, and, and I don't want to reduce this just to financial impact, but I want our listeners to have some understanding of just how dramatic this is. What, what is the financial status of the hospital for 2020, 2021, and 2022 and beyond? Uh, not great. You know, as, as I mentioned, you know, the supply chain costs have really hit us hard. Uh, the loss of electives in 2020 put a big crater in that year's operating budget, as well as the fact that we paid bonuses and other things without the you know, flowing of revenue. So you know, the stimuluses that were paid in 2020 uh, brought us to about a break even. Um, but in 2021, as those stimuluses, uh, stimulus money, federal stimulus money has dried up, and now certainly in 2022, uh, they've completely dried up, you know, we've seen growing operating losses each of the last two years. So we're, we're headed into our third year of substantial operating losses. Uh, this year, uh, we will likely on that $6 billion base budget likely lose between 300 and 350 million, um, which we have a balance sheet. You know, we've got about 200 days cash, uh, but you know, those, those dollars in the, in the, on the balance sheet, those are, our, those are our future investments. Those are our next generation of clinical programs, equipment, uh, how even the next MRI scanner is in that money. <laughs> you know, if we, don't, if we don't have that healthy balance sheet, we don't have the dollars to invest in programs, you know, uh, capital, buildings, and so forth. And unfortunately, healthcare is extremely capital intense. And unlike almost virtually any other industry, every generation of scanner, computer, it costs more. Um, there's, we haven't seen the kind of uh, Moore's law. Moore's, Moore's law. Yeah, yeah. yeah where, where every generation of scanner is, is you know more powerful and less expensive. Yes, it's more powerful, and absolutely, it's more expensive. And that's really, I think, I think that's pretty unique to healthcare. Well, Tom, what do you, you know? We've heard from the Ascension Health System. They said they they lost eight hundred million dollars and. A quarter. Cleveland Clinic just came out and said that they're losing 185 million dollars in 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 a quarter. Some of that's you know lessening of revenues, but increasing costs. Nursing labor costs are going up, and and it, in part the health systems are also under attack because you necessarily have to provide services across a wide spectrum. Some things you make money on, some things you lose money on, and the private sector is coming in to pluck out the parts of the health system that have higher margins that's that are also leaving health systems which are stalwarts of the community in 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 sort of a weaker position what do you see happening in the next five years to strengthen the position the financial position of health systems and what will have to happen in order for them to get get on firm financial standing given this environment it's not just the pandemic yeah, it's a great question, uh, and I wish I had the crystal ball. I think everyone's wondering what exactly is going to have to happen. Y and you mentioned something. You said an interesting thing. You said stalwarts of their community, I, and you know I, I'm curious about what you mean by that because you know we know that there are some institutions like ours that take care of everyone without regard to the ability to pay. That we're both the community hospital, the safety net hospital, and the tertiary quaternary hospital, and 
I think in, a, in the United States in particular, you know, we have sometimes, and depending on the community you're from, segmented those populations. And I'm not sure that's the right thing to do. You know, oftentimes, I think in, in healthcare management circles, it's talked about how America has the best sick care system in the world. You know, if you have a, if you have a serious condition, a rare condition, you're, there's no place other, anywhere else in the world that you probably want to be other than the United States. But we do fall down on some of the basic metrics around quality of care for basic conditions, particularly around basic common conditions and our ability to plug people in and get regular preventative and maintenance care, particularly around chronic conditions. And maybe this is an opportunity for us as a nation to sit down and look at differently at how we do things. I, I don't have a lot of hope that we will do that. Um, with all of the challenges that we're facing, I don't know that this is number one, except insofar as I think the cost of healthcare has gotten people's attention. You know, we're now, what, 18% of GDP, Howie? Somewhere in that range. And as a GDP hog, we're really starting to crowd out other parts of the economy. Well, if hospitals start failing, I mean, I think it will get, you know, it, it will precipitate. But, you know, Howie's one of the world's experts on this issue of financing, so. And, and I think that, you know, there is no more revenue. I think that's the, the institutions that that you've referenced are some of the premier ones in the United States. I mean, you sent me the article about Mass General Brigham, which combined with their announcement of a staggering loss this past quarter, they've also submitted the plan about how they're going to become less expensive. Wow. So and, and there is no more revenue to be paid to Mass General Brigham. So how do you reconcile those? And it's a really good question. It does seem that that something you know truly pivotal, transformative happened with this pandemic that has made it very difficult for our largest institutions and probably our smaller ones even more so, but we just don't hear about it in the press every day, um, much more fragile. And uh, you know, I am concerned because it is not just Yale Haven Hospital and Mass General Brigham and as Harlan said, Ascension, and you can go on and on. But we've got big challenges ahead. What what do you see on the staff end of things when when you think about well being, when you think about wellness, it's almost like the term burnout and physicians are matched in article after article for almost a decade now. That the pandemic probably made it worse, but we sort of accepted that it was an acute phase problem. What do you think we can do? What are the um, proactive things that, that listeners as well as us in the profession can do that can mitigate this? Yeah, it's tough questions today. Do you always ask tough questions? <laughs> Only to you. You know, you. I, I, I take a, take a, I'll take a page from some of Harlan's foundational research, which is, you know, there are, there are places and pockets where there isn't burnout, where there are people who are really energized by their work. I look at the two of you who continue to be more energized every year, year after year, because you find meaning and purpose in what you do, because you're, you're inspiring a new generation of folks that are, come, that are gonna come behind us and do great things. What, what can we learn from those positive deviants? What can we learn from where there isn't burnout? I think we spend a lot of time looking at where the problems are and how can we solve them. Maybe we need to start spending more time looking at, you know, where, where are there opportunities for us to emulate successes. And I think, by the way, I don't think the burnout and the ennui and all the other things that we're seeing in healthcare is solely in healthcare. I mean, I look at my two kids and the jobs that they're pursuing, and they tell me about the same challenges in their very different industries than healthcare. But, but I, I, think it's a, I think it's a nationwide societal issue. I don't think it's just unique to healthcare. I think healthcare has some unique issues to it. And I think the pandemic uh, and the financial challenges and some of our other societal issues have laid bare some of those things, but I don't think it's unique to us. Okay, I want to pepper you with a few quick questions. We'll do a, a rapid fire round. I just have a couple quick ones. What, what's, your, what's been your best day on the job? You know, anytime I have someone who I've worked with and mentored and I see them successful in being promoted. That's great. What's your worst day on the job? Uh, worst day on the job, I think you've shared some of them with me. We lost early on in our patient safety journey the husband of a friend and a coworker, and it laid bare where our challenges were in communication and patient safety. Um, and to have that 
laid bare in such a way was so much a tragedy, but also I think um, it was personal as well as professional. That was maybe one of my worst days too. Tell me about uh, why is building cars something that uh, you enjoy on the weekends? Uh, because I find deep purpose in, no, I don't find any deep purpose in meaning. <laughs> it's exactly the opposite. It's meaningless and purposefulness. But I love <laughs> being able to have a job that has a beginning, middle, and end. And you can create something out of, out of nothing with your hands. <laughs> That's great. How are you? How about you, Any? Well, I, so I'm still curious about um, in the job that you have now compared to the job that you started in 20 plus years ago when you worked in the office of Peter Herbert uh, and, and tackled specific topics. What is the what is the biggest time consumer of a chief medical officer right now? Because, you know, there are the chief of staff roles and credentialing. There's the safety and quality roles. Uh, there's clinical operations. What what do you find the most most of your time being committed to on a daily basis? Listening. You know, I, I spend a lot of time listening and, you know, now uh, my direct involvement in most projects is relatively limited and I'm usually operating through a team uh, of individuals. And it's really important to me to get a deep understanding of what it is they're working on, what challenges they're facing, what barriers they're running into so that I can really define the right question in order to answer. And, you know, I, I think two things have really saved my skin so many times. One is making sure that we get, you know, the old Jim Collins, get the right people on the bus and put them in the right seats. And once you do that, the only other job that I think is incredibly, incredibly important is listening carefully to what they have to say and addressing their challenges as they raise them. But if you can do those, in my opinion, if you can do those two, two things right, find the right people and organize them right, and then listen to them carefully, I, I think your success is almost guaranteed. Well, that might that might be a good place to end. And I would say, Tom, you're you're one of the best listeners I've ever seen. And and your commitment to the people around you is unmatched. It's really unmatched. And uh, I think it's it's a lesson for the rest of us. And it, I definitely think it's been a roadmap for how you've been so successful in what you've done. I want to just thank you for taking the time. And and it's been really great to talk to you. Well, thanks. Thanks very much, Tom. So, Howie, that was a great conversation with Tom. Let's go to our next segment, which is uh, what's on your mind this week? What's what's occupying your thoughts? Well, it's the same thing on both of our minds. You brought this up uh, last week, you know, right after in the aftermath of the second mass shooting uh, in a row. Everybody is talking about this, but we know this is not really a new problem. It's not a limited problem. And so I was looking into this just data wise and, you know, Mother Jones magazine, which is a a left-leaning magazine generally, but they maintain a very methodologically consistent database for mass shootings in the United States. They track mass shootings where more than three people are killed. They exclude mass murders that stemmed from a robbery or gang violence or domestic abuse in private homes. It's a much more limited definition than other databases, and it allows one to look at these indiscriminate terror attacks uh, much more cleanly. And there are some obvious findings. And, you know, we all know this, but it's good to just summarize that, you know, it's almost always men. Of the last 50 such events, only one was exclusively a, a woman perpetrator. More likely using semi-automatic weapons, including both AR-15 and handguns as the most common examples. They're mostly legally purchased and they're increasingly younger individuals. Of the last 10 such events, six were age 21 or younger. Gun violence is a public health problem. It is a serious cause of death and harm to the population. Uh, we've just, for instance, last week learned that firearm deaths overtook motor vehicular trauma as the leading cause of death in children. And it is something that is directly impacted by public policy or the lack thereof. And even suicide 
side, which might seem to be an individual health problem, turns out to be a public health problem. You know, access to guns makes suicide more likely and more likely to be successful. We cannot eradicate suicide, but we can definitely reduce its numbers. And it's clear that once someone is over the acute crisis, the likelihood of future successful suicide is reduced. So to me, there are three ways to think about this problem and the possible sort of policy solutions embedded in that. One is just as a pure health and public policy issue for which there are clear cut strategies that we could take that would reduce gun violence. Two, we could see it as it seems to be as a political issue where gamesmanship by elected officials has an outsized and unusual impact. I continue to hear people uh, on, on the left tell me that unless we have X, Y, and Z, we shouldn't vote for something. And then on the right, people who will not vote for anything. Um, the majority of people in this country, the vast majority of people in this country actually do want evidence-based based change, but the politics favors inertia. Um, and then as a legal and constitutional issue, we're making any and all of the changes that we want to make will run up against constitutional other challenges which have to be considered. So I'm, I'm very aware that most gun owners are responsible and also that it is fairly settled precedent that gun ownership is a right protected by the Second Amendment, a constitutional right. But that is where my support for gun owners ends. We can do an awful lot to maintain safe gun ownership. I want to list just a few policy items that are, are clear in that they would save lives. Will they save all lives? Absolutely not. But will they save lives? Yes. So if we were truly a pro-life society, we would limit private ownership of guns to 21-year-olds or maybe even 25 year olds and older, we would carefully track sales of ammunition. We'd stop selling machines of death such as AR-15 or similar semi-automatic weapons, except under highly regulated circumstances. We would put in place red flag laws that allow authorities to take weapons and rights to weapons away from those who express danger to themselves or others. We would do careful and universal background checks with intentional delay in purchase. We would want there to be a pause between the time that it, it begins the process of getting a gun and actually gets it. And uh, we would require gun safes and place liability squarely on the owner for failure to protect their weapons. And, and we would also consider removing the liability shields for gun manufacturers uh, if other measures cannot be taken. There's so much evidence that they are actively marketing these weapons to high-risk groups. So much as we've talked about with other topics in healthcare, I fear that we will see little or no action after this latest tragedy. We're, we're fortunate that in the next few weeks, we have upcoming guests who are experts and scholars in the area of gun violence, and I look forward to hearing them as well. But I'm curious to hear you know, your thoughts on, on what is obviously a complex topic, and I'm trying to be you know, very reductive in, in my ideas, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this as well. Well, look, I'm, I'm disturbed that the United States is such an outlier here. I mean, it, it, it's not like you can say that this is just the way things are. I mean, look, we are far and away, you know, an outlier in the world population with regard to gun deaths. And I, I do want to raise one thing that kind of bothered me about what was going on in Uvalde, which is it became this sort of singular focus on the police response and 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 blame for them. And and look, there's a need for us to to understand that response and to take it apart and and help to understand how to improve for the future. But it seemed to me to distract from the major issue that this person burst into that school with body armor and and a high powered uh, assault rifle and was able to inflict that kind of damage in a matter of, of just minutes. And in its root, we need to think about this as a public health problem. Thanks for sharing that, Howie. And thanks for the thoughts about policies. I mean, I hope people are listening. You've been listening to Health and Veritas with Harlan Krumholtz and Howie Foreman. So how did we do? To give us your feedback or to keep the conversation going, you can find us on Twitter. I'm um, at HMK Yale. That's H-M-K-Y-A-L-E. And I'm at the Howie. That's at the Howie 
T-H-E-H-O-W-I-E. Aside from Twitter and our podcast, I'm fortunate to be the faculty director of the healthcare track and founder of the EMBA for Executives program at the Yale School of Management. Feel free to reach out via email for more information on our innovative programs, or you can check out our website at som.yale.edu slash EMBA. And we're grateful for the support of the School of Management. They're really our sponsors for this, and, and it's great that, that they've done that. Thanks to our researcher, Jenny Tan, and to our producer, Miranda Schaefer. Talk to you soon, Howie. Thanks very much, Harlan. Talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.